Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckrath, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. Hi, everybody. Um, Tracy Stark with Eating at a Meeting Podcast, and I am here at the IAC America's Knowledge Fest in um, Basking Ridge, New New Jersey at the Ridge Conference Center, which is part of Verizon. And um, I have these two wonderful gentlemen with me to talk about food and beverage trends today. And today we actually have a live studio audience. So Patrick, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon. Patrick Burwell, Senior Vice President, Food and Beverage for Pyramid Global Hospitality. Based in Houston, uh, we're proud to say we have close to 200 different diverse assets, resorts, hotels, conference centers across the country and outlying territories. And then we have a great partnership with Hamilton Hotel Partners over in Europe. Uh, but happy to be here. Nice. Thank you. Happy. Felix. Hi, Felix Maeda, corporate executive chef with Nestle Professional. Um, prior to joining Nestle five years ago, I was with uh, Sodexo and Sodexo Conference Centers, and I supported uh, uh, then uh, Sean Anderson, who was uh, my VP, supported all the conference centers in North America for Sodexo. And now with Nestle Professional, I'm happy to continue my relationship with IAC and uh, be involved and uh, be a support. Awesome. So in today's panel, we're going to talk about food and beverage, a variety of different things, but you've got a planner, a, supp- a hotelier, and then the supplier. So you've got the food chain, except for the <laughs> farmer, right? So um, we're going to talk about it from a lot of different topics from across the board um, and how it impacts all of us. And please, please, please ask us questions because we do want to make sure that we're addressing what your concerns are. Um, so one of the topics that we, I really like in the in you guys benchmark pyramid pyramid hospitality group did i say that right Glo- pyramid global hospitality global, yeah. um put out a food and beverage trends report at the beginning of the year and i like at the very beginning of their report it says mega movements such as food and beverage in 2024 as premium premiumization or enhancing value perception combined with a notion of deeply personal experiences forms the perfect framework for attracting customers so we're really going to look at what all of that means, like premium, I can't say the word, but premiumization means, and then experiences across the board. So premium, what is premiumization and enhancing the value perception from your perspective? Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. So premiumization is really communicating to the customer the exclusivity and the superior quality of a product. And that really goes hand in hand with value. I think we're at a real inflection point in our industry where we've definitely charged very high prices. We've pushed down all operating costs. It's hitting the customer straightforward. And the real barrier is to ensure that the customer understands the value for price paid. That's going to come with premiumization. It's going to come with experience. And we'll get into it later, but it's going to come through different ways that we engage with the guests and really offer ways to enrich. Um, but I think that sets the tone for where we are today. Yeah. And from your perspective of Nestle, do you, are you seeing a level of premiumization? We are, um, mm-hmm. and our focus, um, uh, is supporting and, and showing that value to our, to our partners, mm-hmm. uh, Patrick or, uh, the, 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 the conference center, um, channel or whoever is, um, in that lodging channel that you know we um, are focusing our efforts to support you know the labor challenges that, that we have across the board um, sustainability challenges all the all the points of premiumization that you convey to the to your customer were from a support um, side uh, helping the venues to, to do that sh- with through our products and mm-hmm. services. Okay, so I'm going to jump on that as a meeting planner. The most value for my money 
Patrick. <laughs> I'm a media. I am actually planning three events right now and planning and spending money on food and beverage. And I want that premiumization, but I also need it to meet my budget. I mean, I have a food and beverage spend that I have to meet, but I want that experience. Sure. As well. How do I partner with you with, you know, across, how do we partner across the board, all three of us yeah. to make, to elevate that experience? And I, and Felix, I want you to, to bring in your whole conference experience from last week too, but how do I, how do I, and I'm going to put this word out there because Jesse also said it too, trust you to give me the price that I want with that experience that I expect. Yeah. So there's a lot there to unpack. <laughs> 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 So I think it really starts off with the notion of, you know, the days of a 80 page banquet menu are over. We, we no longer can hand those over to a client and just be an order taker. And there's a lot of great ideas and creativity in those sometimes. Mm-hmm. But what we lack is the personalization of sitting down with the client. And that could be the chef. It could be our conference services team. And just asking the question, what's value for you? What's the experience you're trying to convey to your attendees? And, and go from there and plan the event and, and have that idea of customization with that client and that we're understanding budgetary constraints, we're understanding what, what the menu psychographics of the, of the client is, what they want to eat, what's important to them. And then we get into experiences. And meanwhile, the operator in me is thinking, okay, wh- what is a product I can get at a low cost? Where are partnerships? With Nestle, that maybe is a ready-made product that fits the category of what I'm trying to accomplish from a budgetary perspective. Um, And all these things start to play in mind. So I'm actually building a program that makes sense for the operation and a striving margin, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're delivering a a customized perceived value. All right. So I want to bring up something that I brought up when we were chatting about this before. I'm a meeting planner who has in the past said, I want to take the dessert from lunch and use it as my afternoon break because I don't want to spend that extra money. <laughs> exactly. Well, I also think that we don't need to eat that much food because I'm also on a food waste trend here. I don't want to feed people a dessert then that how many of those desserts are left on the table at the end of lunch and not eaten that are going to go into the landfill because not all properties have a composting process or not, you know, so... I mean, it, and, and, and I am doing a prop, uh, an event at one of um, Patrick's properties um, in a couple of months. And she, she said to me, my goal is not for you. My goal is for you to spend more money with me, Tracy, not take the money from that. So I understand that. But I think it's working with her then to figure out, like you said, sitting down with the chef and designing my menu so that I'm not worried about it. And maybe my desserts are smaller at lunch. Can we do that? So that we're not double over giving sugar 25 times over. Yeah. I think there's an element of retraining a legacy mindset from a meeting attendee. So, you know, for example, doing more batch cookery and microplating to where there's a perception it's, it's hotter and fresher, but we're not putting out aircraft carrier buffets with large shaving dishes, mm-hmm. you know, cause you know, food waste is, a, is, you know, something we talk about all the time. It's catchphrase, but you know, for us put in perspective, 10 of our hotels today account for 40% of our food buy, right? So you look at that coupled with an average for industry is about seven pounds of waste, food waste for every occupied room. We did 7 million occupied rooms last year. So you look at those factors, it's a huge impact. So part of the equation is to, again, re-educate the legacy consumer, but also make sure we effectively communicate the right thing to do from a responsibility standpoint, Mm -hmm. right? And I think there's ways to achieve still a great experience for the consumer. We just do it in a little bit different way. Then it goes back to what I said earlier. It's all about that pre-planning conversation. Right. Yeah. Value perception. Yeah. 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 And then, and, and bringing, you know, those partners in your food and beverage providers and knowing what they're doing. And just before we started, you were talking about how you can go to a, one of your providers, purveyors and say, okay, I want to try these products out. And they actually have the equipment Mm -hmm. that I have in my kitchen. And you're able to try those foods out on that to see how it can talk a little bit about that. It's real. We have, you know, our nationally professional innovation kitchen in uh, Solon, Ohio. And then we have every piece of food service equipment known to make hot in this innovation center. And so you're developing menus and, and, and you want to put together a great 
strategy, we can invite you to our innovation kitchen and test run it. And, you know, so that you will know for certain and real time, hey, is this recipe going to work? Is this, you know, thought process on this menu relevant? Is it really going to work? Can I execute it? You know, boots on the ground. And so I think, you know, that partnership um, is it, it, it's, it's huge. And I yeah. think that it's a great advantage um, for for everybody because you know that what you're getting from a value perception is tried and true. And um, it, it, it just makes makes yeah. sense. And it, it can help you make those those decisions, uh, even on portioning and how you microplate and what you plate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We know. We know what people are going to eat. And we know what they're not going to eat. So... A, you know, sometimes it's a balancing act, but I think that if you have the opportunity to to, to really test it out, take it for a test drive, I think it um, it, it's it's valuable uh, being a valuable part. Yeah. And, and not to jump ahead, but you'd start talking about the human capital factor here and the the really challenge that we're having from a recruitment standpoint and, and hiring you know well trained seasoned staff. It just it doesn't exist anymore, right? So. You know, from a recruiting standpoint, we're going down a grassroots level and recruiting in institutions and trade technical colleges and things like that. But, you know, we have to be mindful of who's receiving the raw product and do they have the skill? Do our team have the training ability to make sure that they're getting most yield out of that product? Or do we do more ready-made and integrate that into what we do? Still high quality, but understanding what are we dealing with from a labor perspective? Yeah, that's that's a, that, that's a great point. And, um, you know, we call it speed scratch in the industry. We're gonna we're gonna do some work in house because we have to. It's just prudent and, and cost effective to do. But how can I bring products in that maybe are, are ready to use to finish a dish or a sauce that's ready to use or a base that's ready to use? Um, looking at um, not only does it taste great, does it look great, but how safe is it? You right. know, what is the what's what's the backstory? You know, is it ready to eat? Has it been tested? Um, does it need a kill step? I mean, these are all critical decisions when you're trying to to do a speed scratch application and make it uh, not only simple for your staff, but uh, protect your organization from any any missteps. So, again, you know, it's a balancing act, and, and that's where that that true partnership. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we talked, we mentioned food waste. So I want to jump into the sustainability aspect of this too. Um, the, who, who was on the food tour the other day with me? Um, so the, um, I chatted with the farmer after the fact, Melinda, and one of the, cause she's going to be on the show next Wednesday. One of the things that she said to me, which is brings us into experience as sustainability is that, I mean, they're growing everything there. They're doing it farm to table, farm to spa, farm to bar. And, but I like the fact that she's like, we have to create, she as a farmer wants to create an experience in the restaurant to get people there. But she's because everybody can order things on Amazon, they can order anything from Target or DoorDash or whatever. So with the food and beverage, she as the farmer wants to help the chef and the culinary team create that experience when they sit down to the table. So how are we, how can we from a food manufacturer perspective, as well as the food service provider maker, how can we create that experience? And when we're looking at next gen experiences, Felix, you just had that experience last week. How do we meld all of those things together so that we're not only being sustainable and doing farm to table truly Mm -hmm. and not greenwashing it, but also bring in the people to, to eat the food? Yeah. That was um, a lot too. <laughs> so a, a couple things, um, farm to table and local, right? Very catch phrase, buzzworthy, right? We've all heard them. Farm to table is truly the definition of A to B. It's the farmer to the operator who's going to execute it. No distributor, no retail component, A to B, right? Local is truly defined as anything within a 400 mile radius of your operation from a sourcing perspective. So we have to go back and make sure, you know, quote, unquote, truth in menu, we're mm-hmm. abiding by that for obvious reasons and, and making sure that we're honest with our consumer. But, um, you know, it's not easy to do. You know, we have a couple of hotels. We're lucky to be able to really tell that story in Turtle Bay out in Hawaii. In Hawaii 
we have uh, Chatham Bars Inn we just acquired in, in Chatham, just north of Boston. You know, these actually have farms literally within 10 minute drive of the property, working farms. They're producing produce at a scale that can you know, fulfill the hotel's needs, which is the other factor here, right? We have to look at it from an operations perspective. If we're going to tell that story, we have to be able to actually get the product to execute it and fulfill the needs of the meetings and events and restaurants. So it's a delicate dance of integrating that, telling that story, but making sure, you know, we're not on the fly subbing for something else and not being true to who we are. Right. right? Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of that, but when you have that, it's a very powerful story, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know, we want to tell the story of our partners. We want to create opportunities for education. You know, with these two examples I mentioned, we definitely can guess some groups out there from an experiential standpoint. You know, we do true farm to table um, dinners and events where we're not just feeding people, but we're educating people on how things are grown, how they're harvested, the sustainability of that from a farming perspective. It, it's it's really powerful. And do you... Do you know who your farmers are that you could introduce Patrick to them if they're buying it from you? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, that's the largest food manufacturing company in the world. So we have a tremendous footprint across the globe. So we also have a tremendous sustainability story for each, each channel that we have from our coffee partners to our miners plant in, in Solon, Ohio. You know, we, we, we are part of the whole, uh, Ohio Proud by Ohio. So we source a lot of ingredients, uh, our fresh, uh, fresher ingredients uh, in Ohio, whatever we can. Um, but we focus on, you know, being a good, um, being a good world citizen. You know, what is our, what is our park and footprint look like? What are we doing in recycling channels? What are we doing with our packaging? How are we making all of our packaging more sustainable and more friendly to the environment? So, um, Nestle has a, a, a tremendous uh, responsibility because of who we are, but we understand how important what we do in the eyes that are upon us, um, how important that they are. And so we are very, uh, very focused on, on sustainability, health, nutrition, and, and, and wellness, um, but it's from 50,000 feet because we're, we're so large. And because we're so large, the decisions that we make have a greater and broader impact. So we're very focused on on, on, on all of this. Farm to table, I can't say that we're farm to table, uh, but I think that um, I, I think that we're good world citizens. And, yeah. and, and, and it's a focus for us. It's front and center. It's one of our pillars um, and something that we will continue to focus on. Um. And so Patrick's got this can of still water here and I've got the the sparkling one. I last week on um, global meetings industry day, I interviewed um, the director of sustainability for IMEX, which is the largest meetings industry conference um, and meet the gentleman for director of sustainability from meet green who works with them. They are going so minute in understanding their carbon footprint. And I think, and I don't know, where your SDGs are coming from and and what directions you're getting from your clients above on how you're managing your SDGs. But they're going so far to find out how much water is being used to produce the plastic bottle that Mm. the water is served in or sold in. So we've got, are we able to, and are you working towards getting that granular to really say, Hey, here's my carbon footprint for this event. Yeah. I mean, Make no mistake about it. People are looking at our sustainable efforts, our um, recycling efforts, sourcing efforts, and making those decisions to meet, eat, feed, sleep at our at our properties, right? And um, I think we have a long way to go, just to be totally oh, transparent. I, it's not going to happen overnight. For you sure. know, a product like this, great. It's a nice next step. I think, you know, Mike's in the room, right? I think he just did it for cost savings, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's there's things like that that we can do that send a great message. But I think the real opportunity for our business is to meaningfully do it. Mm-hmm. And we're not the experts, right? We have to partner with somebody yeah. that's powerful in the industry who does this and helps us tell the story effectively because right. they want that. It's got, you know, so many great companies now are, are creating their own platforms of sustainability that we have to we have to 
acknowledge that and align with it. Right. Yeah. And I mean, and that's going to come down to you all being able to say, hey, you know, from that 500 level thing, but yeah. also coming down to be able to report that. But so that you can understand a couple of examples on Miners Plant in um, outside of Cleveland, um, it's the zero landfill. And it has been for almost three years now. One of Nestle's goals for 2026 is to be 60% zero landfill at our, at our, at our manufacturing facilities. Uh, so it's a huge task. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think that, you know, the importance, you know, for us being a resource to, to our, our partners and operators is that we care and we can help you tell your story and we can, and yeah. want to be able to, to be that resource. Yeah. All right. In your um, food and beverage trends report, you mentioned under sustainability, brewing, upcycling, regenerative, and personalized in, in a variety of different categories. So in the innovation session yesterday, we learned, we saw TJ's facility in, I, I don't remember where it was, but Chef Philip, he's, he's upcycling the skins of different foods and you know, he's dehydrating them. Mm-hmm. So how do you see venues taking the scraps from food, the carrot peels, yep. you know, all of that and upcycling it to make broth or upcycling it to, to do whatever, you know, how can we do that? And, and then from the food and beverage tour too, was the brewing facility that we went to visit and they're taking all of their spent grain and donating it to pick farmers or donating it to bakeries yeah, yeah. to make bread. So how can the facilities, the back of the house, do this economically yeah. and and usefully? Yeah, it's it, it's it's a tough situation because not everybody's got those resources. Okay. Number one, mm-hmm. number two, our, our job, you know, especially given the diversity of our portfolio, mm-hmm. is to connect the operators with best practices or partnerships to be able to do things like that. So a couple of call outs, you know, if you're familiar with Orca, O-R-C-A, which is a food digestive type mm-hmm. of, it's a big bin, right? And it has enzymes and it, it breaks down materials. You can put everything in there with the exception of bone and, and shells from seafood, right? And it will digest everything and it will extract all the water and you can put it right down the drain. But what's left can be used for soil, mm-hmm. And farming, and there's there's opportunities at La Quinta where we use it today, and they use it to do their herb garden. People even pick it up and will use it for, for farming, mm-hmm. municipal farming mm-hmm. purposes. You mentioned the pig farmers. You know, we have a couple of properties like that. Um, Skamania Lodge up in Washington State, which is one of our properties, they, they partner with a pig farmer, and they collect all that waste, and they use it to feed the hogs. And those hogs are, are in a partnership that we have from a pork sourcing perspective. So it's full cycle, right? right? Mm-hmm. And I think, I think the key is, again, it's, it's exposing people to those opportunities and where they can do it. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's not a one size fits all. Right. Everybody can't do it. But, um, you know, I think more and more the consumer is getting onto this mm-hmm. as to what we can do. And it's kind of kind of forced the situation on us right. that we're going to have to find solutions like that to, to not put more in landfill and not produce more waste, but meaningfully, Use it in an effective way. Simon from Y Boston, he won the Innovation Award last year for what they're doing on their property. And they have one of those digesters or they have a composter, I want to say. They can compost breakfast by lunchtime. And they're giving that compost to the gardening team because they've got a lot of property out there, putting it on their gardens and on their trees. They plant a tree for every guest who does who turns down room service, I guess. And so they're putting that compost on those trees and it's such good compost that the golf course has asked them not to give it to them as much because the grass is growing too fast and they're having to use mow the lawns too much. So it's, it's a like it's a full cycle thing here, but you know, it's, so it means that it's good. We're doing it so well. Um, but not, again, not everybody can have that right. or do that. Right. Um, Somebody, oh, the coffee brewer that we went to the other day here in Jersey, and and I know in my local Starbucks they do it too. They're taking their used coffee grounds after coffee growing, brewing the coffee. They're bagging it up in the bags that were shipped, the, the beans were shipped in, and putting it on their front stoop for the consumers in the neighborhood to come pick up and put on their um, flowers in their gardens. 
So that's another way too, if you're a facility, you can take those grounds and, and be a community service, sell it, or just give it away, right? In doing that. Um, okay. Battling inflation and the guest choice of dining out. <laughs> so, the, and I know I've mentioned it three times. Um, I want to, battling inflation, it's, it's a meeting planner. It's, I mean, I have spreadsheets like spreadsheets of how many percentage of people come, came to this event last, this specific food and beverage of last year, and how many do I expect to come to this year, et cetera, because I don't want to over order to manage the food waste. But we also have Gen Z and Felix, you had this experience last week going to the Nestle conference. So can you tell everybody what you visualized in, in that well, event? Well, you know, it was a it was a great conference and very you know breakfast, lunch, dinner breaks. Um, about five hundred folks attending, and and there was a uh, a large um, Gen Z population in attendance, um, and and we saw throughout throughout all day parts that the that the Gen Zers kind of wanted to be off in their own group. Um, not going through the buffet lines and food lines, but, you know, ordering food in from their apps and kind of doing their own thing and, and, and having their own uh, experience, making their own experience. It was, you know, we were in um, in Phoenix and it was beautiful and, and the surroundings were great. Um, and and so from a meeting planner point, I'm thinking there's probably 100 to 125 folks that were paid for it. In the meal package, not eating from the meal package, but spending probably money that they're going to expense on it. That's what I was just going to ask you. They're putting it on their feed card and expensing it. But um, that's the world we live in, you know. So I know, Patrick, you probably, you know, are faced with similar scenarios because you're trying to capture every uh, food and beverage revenue dollar that you can. And then you're, but you're in competition. You, how many apps yeah. do you say they have? Uh, eight to ten different food apps on their phone, which boggles my mind because it's like three times as much money to get to pay that delivery fee. But they don't care. That's that's what they know, right? Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. they're the third generation. The rain's on technology. With technology, you know. I gave my daughter an extra sketch, and she started pushing the screen. <laughs> <laughs> right? but she doesn't know what the bits. Um, no, she was disappointed. It didn't work. Um, but um, yeah, it's impulse and it's convenience, and they don't want to deal with people. Correct. They want it when they want it, and they and, and they're fine with the zero human contact. Um, you know, I I think you know it goes back to menu set graphics and knowing your customer and knowing what we need to do to to meet their demand. But um, you know, you talk about the value for price just from a restaurant perspective, right? When you look at the cost of inflation year over year. The cost of dining out has gone up five times comparatively to the cost of actually going to the store and buying your own groceries. Mm -hmm. So when we look at some of our destination hotels on the independent side, we're seeing 30 to 40% local capture, which means those customers at risk of even coming to us <laughs> as a consumer, right? They're like, it's cheaper for me to just go and cook at home, right? So we have to constantly battle that. And it goes back to what we started with. It's premiumization and telling the story and finding opportunities to drive value through enriching partnerships and, and, and products. Um, but it is a challenge and we're constantly fighting that now. And so or go ahead. No, I was going to say, and even, you know, beyond the, the standard uh, food and beverage packages, I think it's important that, you know, you want to capture revenue 24 seven. So now sure. you're seeing a lot of micro markets springing up in, in, um, in conference centers and hotels, you know, Meeting that out of home need um, whenever doesn't cost anything. You know, it could be a refrigerator or a freezer filled with retail products, and uh, you know they take it back to their room and microwave it, or if there's a station set up. So, I mean, food and beverage is not certainly not limited to, to meal periods anymore. It's right. it's it's twenty four seven. So, yeah, and we're doing things like meal kits, you know, ready-made meal kits where you can order it pre-stay or they're available in grab-a-go markets that we have in our hotels. Um, we're doing things like ghost kitchens. You've heard of ghost kitchens, right, where we're actually deceiving the guests a little bit. We have what? concepts and models built behind the scenes, no brick and mortar guests facing, 
but we're competing with those apps directly, mm-hmm. but it's our infrastructure that's doing it. Interesting. Well, even coming here, I flew through Raleigh or through from Raleigh and they basically have a ghost kitchen. There is a stall there that you go up and you push the buttons. There is not a counter. It is not a restaurant. You push the buttons and then your food is put in a locker and you have the code to open the locker and then you get your food out. Yep. And uh, in there was probably about 15 people in line to go up to that kiosk and do that. And then coming back and it's just a kitchen in the back of the, it's basically your kitchen in the back of the house making food mm-hmm. with a variety. I didn't go up to the kiosk to see what was offered, but um, it was, it's a concept that's been around. They, I've ha- I think they've had that for at least four years now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I did see something that ghost kitchens are not necessarily going to stay with the thing, or do you think they're still going to be viable? No, I, I think that they've kind of fizzled out for the most part, but I think our industry, the lodging industry has actually started to find a way on how we make it happen. You know, we still have guests that are coming in our hotels with, you know, bags from the, the gas station of snacks and beverages. Again, the, the root causes look at the travel and the cost from A to B for the consumer air, air you know, flights and transportation and, you know, just the stress mm-hmm. of travel these days. And, and you see that you see pizza delivery and you see all these mm-hmm. things that we have to compete with. We want capture on our hotels, but we have to come up with a different way to yeah. go after them. Well, even I was at, I was at producing an event a couple of years ago, and the whole lobby was filled with people waiting for their pizza delivery or whatever because their restaurants weren't open. Yep. And I mean, yeah. and granted, that was still that was still coming out of COVID, but it was how do we how do you battle that, right? Yeah. So, and I mean, and this property is different because we're private, but. There's not some place you're definitely going to be using your apps because there's not really a place to walk to from mm-hmm. here to go out and get it. I want to I want to jump on the pa- the personalization aspect of this too. Um, in my presentation yesterday, you know, looking at menu design based on different dietary restrictions, reducing costs by saying, "Hey, these multiple items meet these different dietary restrictions." Oh. How can we do that personalization, being safe, but also helping you reduce your costs and you provide products that meet those needs and the meeting planner being able to not pull their hair out or turn gray right here um, because I'm trying to figure out how to feed multiple people with different dietary restrictions. Does that, was there a question in that? I think, yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, as far as dietary restrictions, I mean, you know, we, we focus on health, nutrition, and wellness. We have gluten-free items, certified gluten-free items. We have vegetarian items. We have vegan items. And, you know, we uh, can verify to the source, you know, We're like we know that we don't process any sugar scoop bone char. That's one of our standards. You know, we're very rigorous. Uh, Did anybody uh, know, does everybody know that sugar is not vegan because it has bone char in it? You have to buy certified vegan sugar. Yeah. And so when we when we make a claim like that, you know, it's to the source. And, uh, it's funny because I want to talk about um, personalization. Yep. So you know that I was, you know, in, in conference, conference centers for many, many years. And we were always trying to be on the cutting edge of how do we make it different? How do we make the food experience better, the food memories better? Um, the, we were just chatting earlier today, having a cup of coffee. And I said, you know, I think that we can use technology to develop menus and develop um, food stations that mirror um, a Panera or, you know, a popular uh, re- restaurant that, that the Gen Zers like to go pick up from. Uh, and, and, and maybe we intertwine it into a C Van app. I, I don't know how it works yet. It's just kind of. You should let me get those ideas on my on my my third Manhattan. <laughs> my wife. <laughs> when I get to the second one, she starts taking notes. Some good ideas come up. But you know, I think that we have to we have to think really outside the box. We really have to get away from the breakfast, lunch, dinner, break mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, and and, and 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 maybe you do something with your regular you know your regular day parts at a ghost kitchen. I, I don't know what it is, but you know, sitting around in the think tank, providing the solution, which is going to be here because that's where everybody's going to go. 
And, you know, maybe, hey, let's let's skip the buffet line. I don't want my senior manager to see me today. I want to be in flip-flops and shorts and go hang by the pool. Let me just do that, order it, pay for it, go pick it up. Or maybe if it's even included, that's not what you fight that battle. Right. You know, maybe they can use the, the leftover dessert. <laughs> so <laughs> much. <laughs> but that's where I think that we're going. I mean, I think we're going to have to evolve into um, what the customer, what our customers want. And and I want to say, too, the customer is not me as the meeting planner. The customer is my 500 attendees. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, me as the meeting planner, picking the food from that 80-page menu, right, is a challenge in and of itself. But I'm trying to feed all of these 500 people. I mean, I did an event at MGM years ago, and I was just on the food and beverage team. We were feeding four to 7,000 people for lunch per day. And we had 685 people with dietary restrictions. And it was a multi-cart golf cart train of plates that came out. And we also have to think about how we implement that, how we execute that experience. Yeah. Because, you know, we usually, people with dietary restrictions get their plate last, yeah. right? Or how does that work? Or in that situation, they didn't even know they were supposed to stop and pick it up at his place. And they're all the way on the other side of the conference center, right? Or the convention center. So figuring out that personalization and is there that place, can you make it that fun destination? And we actually were talking about food trucks before. Yeah. How do we create that sort of experience or small town experience mm-hmm. in a conference center environment? Yeah. I want to, I want to tag on to what you said about, about allergens and that's, that's becoming a real uh, point of conversation in a lot of states. Um, food code was just updated. There's a lot more transparency for the consumer on what allergens they may be at risk to in our facilities. So the labeling, the education, the training from a culinary production standpoint is paramount. Um, and, you know, there's there's things that we have to recognize are, frankly, liability for us. Mm-hmm. You know, not just to keep our guests safe, but um, just to do the right thing, right? So it's it's something that we're challenging our teams with to go back and educate themselves and making sure that their teams are clearly understanding of what the risk is, um, because it's it's getting real, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but you know, to talk about the customization and and things like that, I think when we look at we look at two sides of the coin from an operator's perspective. There's menu engineering, and then there's menu uh, psychographics. Engineering is understanding the data points, what's selling, what's not selling, what's got a high margin uh, potential. And then there is that exercise of tweaking and modifying that menu. So it makes sense from a from business perspective. Then there's a psychographics, right? Understanding your customer. We talked about Gen Z. You know, It's younger, higher expendable income. They want to learn. They want to be enriched. They want to be educated. They want that experience. And it, it's no longer picked from ABC, right? It's what that consumer wants. You know, we talk a lot about wellness these days and everybody wants wellness. Well, it's actually, it's far beyond that. It's, you know, it's prebiotic, probiotic. It's it's brain wellness. It's vitamin K foods, leafy greens, you know, fermented milks, all these things that, the average consumer doesn't really understand, but our opportunity as the operator is to integrate that, right, meaningfully where it makes sense. Yes. Mm-hmm. We don't want to smack people in the face with it too much. People still want to have fun, creative, craveable foods, but do it in a way where we're almost from a DEI perspective, right? Mm-hmm. We're understanding that consumer and crafting an experience for them too. Same thing in a bar environment. You know, you have a lot of zero based. Uh, excuse me, uh, zero free cocktails, right? Yeah. Uh, ABV. And, um, you know, you see a lot of um, restaurants, bars, even in the banquet and catering section is, you know, you have a craft cocktail, zero based right now. It's all integrated into your regular cocktails. And frankly, at the same price point. Yeah. And we're doing that because we're spending a lot of time meaningfully crafting and sourcing those cocktails. So there's value, but from a DEI perspective, you know, you could not be a drinker or you want to get up at 7 a.m. tomorrow and be productive, Mm -hmm. right? But you still want to be part of the party, right? So we're being mindful of that um, from a consumer perspective. I think it's really cool. What's really cool about that is, you know, 
it wasn't long ago we were we were talking about you know specialized menus, gluten free, vegan, a lot, whatever, you know. And, and we were sitting around and said, you know, somebody shouldn't have to change their dietary needs to come to a conference, right? There, we should be all things for everybody, and and they should be made to feel. Um, just as normal as anybody else, right? They shouldn't have to wait to get the cube labs. They shouldn't have to go through any um, any drama. And I see that now happening on on the beverage side, mm-hmm. you know. And and, and it, like you said, it is. It's inclusive. Like you know, we're providing a place for everybody. And I think I I always say that at the end of the day, we're in hospitality. Right, so you have to be hospitable. You have to learn how to be hospitable. You have to want to be hospitable. You know, it's it's not a drudgery. It's not like oh, you know, you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, and and you've got employees, and you've got employees here. Um, Vincente, who just got promoted from as a, I, I'm looking at you. Do you work at this property? No, never mind. Brock, I. Um, so he zero lot I know. Yeah, I well, I have been for five years now. So, but um, you know, he 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 speaks limited English, but he understood. He grasped what I was trying to say to him, and he loves his job. But but he just got promoted from a food um, expediter basically to a server, and and he was his love for what he was doing was is very showing in that. But it it is educating that that value of that to, to the people who love to do their job. But I also am, I mean, I went to a part, I went to an industry event and they're like, Hey, here's a mocktail. And I'm like, okay, great. And I took a sip of it and the flavor was good. And I'm like, what is it? It's cheer wine and fresca. I'm like <laughs> you can have this back now, please. Right. And, and I don't want my drinks with soda and, and that's the functional foods. Mm-hmm. I don't want my mocktail to be, juice loaded with sugar yeah i want it to be farm to bar you know and using fresh freshly juiced things or you know using the brand of spiritless or using the brand of ritual my dad can't drink alcohol anymore because of this medication and he has a gin drink every day from ritual non-alcoholic gin with his and his buddies come over and he is so happy my mom's I think we're getting delivered three times a, um, a month because my dad's drinking it so much. So adding that in, so we're spending the money. And the stat that I used yesterday, I think it's 60, 64% of people who are buying the non-alcoholic beverages are people who still do drink. Mm-hmm. And so it's because, and 30% of people do not drink after they don't drink at all, or they stop drinking after one drink. So you have the opportunity to make a buttload of money yeah, by selling a non-alcoholic beverage that's not a soda. Because your margin is going to be higher than on a Coke. Sure. Well, depending on what you negotiated. But yeah. You know, so figuring out how to do that to make that inclusion experience happen at the bar is just as important. Mm-hmm. Um, the, all right, staffing and training. I mean, we've, we've got this challenge of, of making sure that everybody's trained when we're coming in and and getting people. And Jesse asked that question today, you know, this industry is not nine to five, right? It is 6 30 AM until midnight sometimes or, and whoever you've got it. So we have to make it enticing. How do we make, and the food and beverage teams, but there are people who in the food and beverage side that have worked at properties for 30 something years. They love their job, but how do we get a Gen Z to understand that? And to be so valuable in that and then keep your costs low of managing that, of managing the labor, but executing and getting them involved. Yeah, I think the, the, the true secret sauce is making sure there's opportunities for people to advance and learn and grow from a technical and a personal standpoint. You know, we, we have people coming into our business who want instant gratification. They want to be thanked at the end of the day and they want that gold star. We didn't come up in that. No. And we have to really recognize that because that that's what they need, right? It's not it's not something that's a perception. It's it's a fact, right? And I think we have to really understand that. Um, and then you hear a lot about work life balance. You know, what does that mean 
to you? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? It's all different. And even at the corporate level, I have people on my team, I have to be very sensitive to the fact that we are a 24-7 business, but at the end of the day, there are people too, and we all have work-life balance. And making sure that's meaningfully expressed and actually lived for them is really is really mm-hmm. critical. People are jumping for another ten, twenty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Right? It's inconsequential. But I, I'm a believer that people don't jump and change jobs because of the money. It's because of the experience they're getting from an employee employer standpoint. Yeah. 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 What well, Ellie, I'm not talking. Oh yeah. Sorry. My niece works for a company and she worked a convention recently. And I mean she's twenty three and she's like, Oh my God. I had to be up at six o'clock in the morning and we worked until 10 o'clock at night. And where's my comp time and, and all this. And, and then she's on the communication side of it. And it, so it is that right. And how do you, and she's like, I, she was calculating her hours to see how many days off she got, you know, comped after that. But it it is something that is being thought by not just my niece, but by a variety of young yeah. people that are coming into the workforce. And I do think that there are somewhat, some kids, and I'm not going to bunch them all together or separate them all, that are willing to work really hard. Absolutely. They they understand that job. They want to get it done. And But it, it, it is an industry that we have to figure out. Um, and I want to jump to the training aspect of kind of going back to the allergy. You mentioned it, training and communications around the allergen part. Um, I was at a food allergy safety summit last month, um, and I sat on the panel with um, the head of global food safety for Marriott, as, as well as one of their trainers. And Marriott is making it brand standard that everybody in the food service side of it has to go through food allergy training. And it's in their LMS and it will, and it was reiterated, how do you educate them? And it's not just throwing them, Hey, go take this class online, right? Now you have to reiterate it. So how do we do that in team meetings or in the 15 minutes staff call before the big book goes live. How do we continue to reinforce not just the allergen training, but any other kind of training or SOPs that we have across the board? Yeah, I think it's multiple layers. You know, we partner up with EgoSure um, um, and, you know, they're a great resource, a global partner. We have customized uh, training platforms like Lobster Ake. Okay. Um, so we're doing some specialized training, not just in food safety and sanitation, but allergens and other things people need to be more mindful of the pre-shift topic. It's all these layers of inundating the teams with opportunities to either expose our partners or just frankly educate. Again, it's there's a lot of technicality to some of this stuff where they just don't understand it. And, and for us as the leaders is we have to do it in a way that's palatable and consumable by our team members and they get it and safely make sure they understand the risk and liability and how they're at the front lines and we're arming them with the information to to take care of our guests. I mean, I, I say it all the time. I mean, they're your ambassadors. Absolutely. They're the ones, chefs in the back, for the most part, you know, they're the ones out there showcasing your property to you. Showcasing, and I mean, on your, yeah, I mean, they're not out there on your showcasing Nestle product, no. but but how, do, how are you managing staffing-wise coming up through the manufacturers to help the your partners in oh. food service? Well, you know, training, 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 but, you know, I want to address part because I, I did spend 35 years in the kitchen. Right. And let me just say this. It all begins, uh, success begins or begins and ends or fails in the kitchen at the back door, right? So training, um, your chefs, your cooks, your porters, anybody that touches food should be highly trained on allergen awareness, you know, can be any cross contact, you know, making sure that we're storing foods properly in the right places. We have to um, sequester a product to a different portion of the kitchen where that's your purple zone. So it is, it, it, it begins and ends with really, really strict training. And then that has to um, spill over to the front of the house. And there, there has to be training amongst all of the, the supervisors, the bank captains, anybody mm-hmm. in the front of the house so that, um, it's not an afterthought. It's a priority. And I think that um, when people understand that it's life and death, and it can be life and death for people, then you get their attention. 
And we always used the uh, eco tour with, with some XO as well, mm-hmm. you know, and they had some pretty crazy videos that, that were very well thought, but it, and, and it scared the bejeebus out of you. <laughs> You know, and then you get some of the people where their eyes are like this, like, yeah, that can happen. So, you know, training, training, training. From our standpoint at Nestle, I mean, it's rigorous um, sourcing. That's where it starts with us. Everything is tested. Nothing, our, our plants are so uh, locked down that nothing gets in the back door unless it is fully screened that past the battery of, of, of um, scientific testing. I mean, I've seen videos on it. We can't even get into the factory, the miners plant anymore. It's that locked down. Um, and, it, and it needs to be that way. So from from an operator standpoint, I, you know, you want to be looking towards partners that understand your risk, right? Because we share the same, we share the same risk. If we tell you that something is allergen free, you can really sure that we probably spent a couple million dollars making sure that it's <laughs> allergen free, right? Because we're going to show you it, you know, across the United States. Yeah. Right. So, you know, and I put my chef's hat back on because, you know, sometimes it's not about price. It's about the value, right? So I, I don't play in the pricing sandbox. I can't do that because the value that we offer um, doesn't fit in that sandbox. You know, the operator has to make the decision, where am I going to spend my dollars? And if uh, food safety and allergen safety and awareness is at the top of your list, then I I think I'm going to go to a different venue. Because, you know, sure. Yeah. All right. And I, we've been chatting this whole time, and I want to ask questions, but I also want to throw Ben in on, you know, on this conversation. Um, because Ben's in the U.K., and the U.K. has, for 10 years, we figured it out, 10 years had very strict in the EU in general, very strict food allergen labeling laws. Um, They they have 14 allergens. They have to label for celery, mustard, lupine, shellfish or separate, gluten, and sulfites um, outside of the nine that we have. Um, From your perspective, what has been your biggest challenge and or success in managing this and it and in a conversation that he and I had yesterday, it's not the front of the house staff. It ends up being on his shoulders. So can you and I you're not on the microphone and I'll just kind of repeat it, but I think in terms of success it's fine for us. Uh, obviously ten years down the line, training is uh you know it's done at, at day one when it shared all the investigation. Um you know it's the 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 box starts with the chefs at the end of the day, so it's the fire house guys come into the kitchen, ask chefs, um, so down to, you know, the chef's responsibility at the day, but for me, it's, you know, back of tickets, large number of covers, it's peace of mind. Yep. Yeah. yeah pre order. We don't use coming in. We don't want many reasons off. Um, we can adjust the menu and it's not a, you know, half the thought. It's a, you know, I'll take it at the same time. Uh, but yeah, it, it is all down to training. The track is, um, it, you know, it's, it's it's a couple of hours, um, but it's also on the job knowledge. It's all the hidden things which which we then sort of follow up on. So, uh, sort of short some blue, for instance, and Tahiti, Sesame Seeds, and those, those little uh, hidden things, which uh, are more of a concern than anything else. But it, it's a bit of training. That's, yeah. That is absolutely key. All right. And even the front of the house, and, I, and, t- and you all tell me when, when the platter of bacon comes out and it says it's gluten-free and then i look at the bottom of it and there's bread at the bottom to soak up the oil who's who's then is that coming from the back of the house and then the front of the house says that actually doesn't know what's happening and this is not an allergen conversation but it's sobs it's standard of operating procedures from the front of the house and the back of the house to have that conversation yeah and, it, the- and it's also so many layers of a check and balance before right. it reaches the consumer right so like there's there's sometimes a, a, just an acceptance of what front of the house gets from back of the house and there's not an opportunity to question it and and find a potential issue before right. it reaches the consumer. But to answer your question, that's not gluten-free. No. Well, okay. So I want to, and then I want to have another, this is a, to me, this is a thing with, with you all being venues, the front of the house and the back of the house are like two separate, you're like, yeah, they fight. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I was chatting with a woman in, a, in Newburn where I live and she's worked in restaurants and 
And she's gotten servers yelled at by chefs by going back and asking, can you ask, can you tell me if this is this or this or this? He's like, he or she is like, I don't have time for that question. Why are you back here bothering me? And then that front of the house staff person comes back very demoralized. And it is their level of customer service is now diminished to that, to the server. How do we fix that? One word culture, yeah. Yeah. right? And, and having a, a culture where you have, you have a collaborative team that's constantly looking for ways to improve and constantly has one common goal. And that's driving the business, great experience for the guests, end of the day, safety and, and, you know, protection of our guests and the business. Yeah, that's a hundred percent right. You know, as my progression throughout, throughout the years, you know, I've seen that culture shift. I've had to be um, open to it, um, willing to be educated and willing to have to teach that because it is a culture shift. And you could see, you know, as a lot of the um, the older chefs are, are, are moving into retirement age, it's, it's, it's a younger generation. They're more aware. Uh, it's it, it's normal to have gluten-free allergies and nut-free allergies. They grew up with it. So they're sensitive to it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that as we continue to foster that culture and be sensitive to it and, and, and make it normal, you know, you're not bothering me. This is, right. you know, we're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, right? Isn't that the standard? So we should have, um, from the back of the house, should embrace that whole house and, and say, listen, you know, a big part of my job is to teach you how important it is to take care of our guests whether it's getting them a soda that they like or making sure that their gluten-free meal is, is gluten-free, right? That's really yeah. taking care of The them. best leaders now are mentors and teachers, yeah. right? like that gentleman. Um, that's that's exactly it. All right, and I want to take that what, a, a completely different level, and we're at just a few minutes before 11, but to the cultural aspect. We have a lot of different people from different backgrounds culturally um, and ethnically, that are working in our kitchens and working in the front of the house. I've seen some really good collaborations of chefs and kitchens that are like, oh, wait a minute, you're from Thailand or you're from China or whatever. And can you help me design this menu versus, hey, I'm going to just crapshoot this sushi or I'm going to crapshoot this Indian dish. I've never cooked it before. Using the people that that work for them. Hey, bring me your mother's dishes. Let's incorporate that. Have you seen success in that? Absolutely. I mean, people get so excited about those opportunities mm-hmm. to learn from each other. Somebody you're sitting next to or working next to in the kitchen and learning something from them and something as special as it could be a family recipe or something mm-hmm. that's indigenous to them. We're, we're building out the, the first ever National Geographic Hotel and Conference Center in, in Washington, D.C. Oh, cool. And we're creating a food hall there. And, and our stake in the ground is it has to be authentic, literally one step removed if we went to that country and bought it ourselves. So the sourcing, how it's made, you know, we talk about making a, a banh mi, right, uh, at this station. Well, how is the bread made? What's the flour? What's the water? Minerality content. All of these things that we're thinking about because we want it to be authentic. And I think that that runs full circle, right? You know, right. there's a training between colleague and, 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 and other colleagues, but there's also this, this opportunity to deliver a great experience through yeah. authenticity. I was just at the university of Maryland and they built this new dining hall and it's actually on, on, on indigenous land. And so they went to the, um, the tribe and said, how can we partner with you to bring this knowledge of the food and beverage into this dining hall? So they meet with them weekly or monthly, and they actually have a whole station in the dining hall that is all indigenous food. And so bringing that in and along all of the walls throughout the, through the dining hall is the story of that tribe. And I think that's a really cool thing to help educate these young students on where the land that they're, they're, going to school on absolutely oh it's the bane of my existence and i teach planners all the time i mean you've got one you need to track that information from year over year especially i mean if it's the same kind of group but it is planning that i'm like i'm constantly asking my client because i don't have access to the reg list i'm like can you pull me your report can you pull me your report and even one of my clients the one we're coming to to la cantera 
She's like, well, we don't have, we really don't have anybody with allergies or whatever. And I pulled it and we've got somebody with a nut allergy cannot be in the room with it. So I'm like, so they're going to go to the extreme and saying nothing on our menu is being planned with any kind of nuts in it. But it, it really does need to start from that RFP. Like, hey, when if you get that RFP from a client, you say, okay, I want to talk dietary restrictions now, right? And And have you had any in the past? And use that historical data first before you maybe get those registrations in. But I also think have some chef make a whole menu like that meets a variety of different needs. So you have it in your back pocket that you know, hey, we could chef... I know you're on the fly right now. You've got a 10 day homestand. We need to make this dish for this person. And you already have that recipe in your little catalog of recipes that you know you can pull out because that's going to make his, his or her life easier, your life easier. And then you've got it. It's when my one friend, Chef Ashley, she said when she goes to weddings and she's a caterer. So she's like, I've got my bucket over here for any of those last minute things that I need to meet those needs. So from your perspective, design those menus so that you have it. And it reminds me too of Steve Wynn when he still owned Wynn Hotels, right? He got a divorce and was dating a new woman who was on the raw diet or something like that. And he went, he took her, he wanted to wine and dine her in his own hotel and he couldn't because there's nothing for him to eat, for them to eat. So he challenged all of the restaurants and all of the catering teams to come up with menus. And now they have menus that are here are all the peanut free ones here are all the dairy free ones here are all the dairy free gluten free ones so you could have those menus already pre-designed and in your rolodex and i'm going to say put it in your contracts i'm telling planners to put it into your contracts and you can say we are not an allergen free facility but we do this is what we do this is the food safety training that we have these are the number of staffs and maybe you've got an allergen person that you can say tj actually said this that um at his property, um, they've got an allergen person on staff for every single food function. So that person can go to that person and an- a culinary concierge is what I call them, you know, so they can answer the questions of what's in all of these different foods. All good? Great. All right. Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrat, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com. And if you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.